Tokyo Drifter is a stylish Shakuza film directed by Seijun Suzuki and released in 1966. It's admired for its avant-garde visuals, its vibrant color palette, and its innovative storytelling techniques, which distinguish it from traditional Yakuza films of that time. But beneath its stylish exterior, Tokyo Drifter explores themes of loyalty, honor, and the inevitability of fate. A commercial failure at the time, it has since become a cult favorite and is acknowledged by critics for its artistic innovation and influence on other filmmakers. I am New York City zero budget guerrilla filmmaker, Sean Weathers. And I'm Canadian screenwriter and playwright, Angus Combe. Watch along with us as we comment on, react to, and review Seijun Suzuki's boundary pushing, genre bending cult classic, Tokyo Drifter. You are watching Screened. So, so this is a this is a challenging movie for a few reasons. <laughs> uh, do you want to do you want to start your, with your thoughts on it? Your general uh, thoughts before we start commenting. Well, I mean, I think the key is that uh, I had never seen it before. I didn't know what to expect at all, and um, I guess I kind of imagined it was going to be a yakuza film, which I guess it is. And I've I've seen a a number of yakuza films. But, um, but it's really not like the average Yakuza film. It's very, very different. It's very unusual. So it really kind of surprised me and took me aback. And uh, I found myself a little uh, confused as to how to even react to it. Um, how about you? So this was on my watch list. And there are certain movies that just stayed on my watch list for years, some even for decades. And you're just looking for an excuse to watch them. Um, that happened to me with um, Women of the Night, a.k.a. I was a teenage Nazi or something like that, um, that I posted on my channel. I should know the name of it. It's on my channel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, yeah, so it's like I was waiting to, to watch that movie. Let me just get the exact name. Let me go to my channel to see what content I'm putting out. By the way, you guys should go to my channel, even though I don't go to my own channel to know what I'm posting. But um, it was... Uh, curse of a teenage nazi aka women of the night and it sounded like such an outlandish title from 1948 that i'm like man i just added it to my watch list and i just never watched it for like over 10 years then i finally posted it on my channel and watched it and it was like yeah it didn't live up to the hype but it was more so like it didn't matter how good it was or it wasn't it's just the release of just watching something that's been talked about or like in your mind been like elevated and just getting that hurdle and this was kind of my, one of my hurdles for art films it's just like all right this is a film i've heard of for a while i didn't know anything about it at all we did this with house that was a movie we reviewed as well it was just like i don't know anything about one second of the film but i just knew based on the title and its reputation it was a must watch and much like with house that we reviewed much like with Curse of a Teenage Nazi that I posted on my channel, the full movie. And much like this, it's great to get it off the watch list, but sometimes it just doesn't live up to the hype that you made in your head or that you heard about um, online or through blogs or wherever, magazines or, you know, people like you used to read those things. Um, but um, yeah, it was kind of disappointing, but I'm still happy I saw it. I guess that's a short version of what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And I guess that, that opening sequence that we just saw, that was almost entirely in black and white, which, um, you know, I kind of, when I saw that, I thought, oh, okay, this movie's in black and white, because I know there certainly are Yakuza films that are in black and white, and even uh, Seijun Suzuki has made Yakuza films in black and white. So I figured, yeah, okay, this movie's in black and white, until... All of a sudden, we see a little bit of color there. We see that, I think it's a toy gun, right before we went to the credits here, a red toy gun. And uh, that made me think of uh, Rumblefish, the Francis Ford Coppola film, which is almost entirely black and white, but the Rumblefish are in color. And I think that maybe there's more color that comes in eventually, but it's, it's essentially black and white with this little bit of color that's meant to emphasize something or uh, maybe be symbolic in a way. Um, 
I'm not sure why he chose to do the opening of this film in black and white um, and then have that toy gun kind of emphasized. I don't know, if, is he is he saying something about this movie? It's it's all a game. It's uh, it's like a child's game. It's a toy gun. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> did you have any thoughts about that? Why he started in black and white? Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that um, anyone who saw the director commentary knows exactly what it is. <laughs> I'm not going to pretend that I don't know what he's trying to accomplish. But initially when I saw it, before I heard what he was trying to accomplish, I'll say both. I'll say his version of what I initially thought to play into what you're trying to lead me into. Artistically, I saw it as, oh, it's a gun, it's a toy gun, and it's kind of in red. So red meaning danger, and the gun being, instead of a real gun, a toy gun, shows it's like these guys are playing with danger. And by messing with this lead character, you're playing with danger because you, you, you're messing with the wrong guy, essentially. And eventually you're going to meet your doom. So I thought it was great until I saw the director commentary. And it was like, yeah, we just wanted to use up these old film, black and white film. And it was cheaper. So we just had the intro of black and white. And I decided to put the gun in color. So, um yeah, he kind of ruined the mystique. But before I saw the the, the behind the scenes, I, I thought it was brilliant. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I guess I saw him saying something like, uh, I don't know why I did that. Um, but it kind of, you know, it makes me think of some, some filmmakers who are like artists and they don't necessarily know why they do something. You know, why do they make an artistic choice? But somewhere deep down inside, they have the spirit of an artist and they just kind of sense that this is the right idea. So maybe on some level he did kind of feel that this would be thematically relevant and that's why he chose to do that. Um, but then nice when try. he kind of talk, nice <laughs> <laughs> but when he talks about it, he's like, nah, you know, I'm just, uh, just using up film or whatever. But, um, no, you don't, you don't think so. You think I'm it's, not buying uh, it. <laughs> no. I'm not buying it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it was, Bob Dylan, you know, when people ask him, what is your, what do your songs mean? He says something like, uh, you know, it means what it is. You know, he, he won't really talk about it. You know, he clearly has artistic ideas, but he, he just kind of pretends that it's, it's nothing in a way. Mm -hmm. um, but Sometimes you don't it's better what... to have that mystery and keep your mouth shut. I wish, yeah. I wish I didn't watch the blind scenes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess there certainly have been cases where people have made a film and maybe had an intention, like you were saying with, uh, with, uh, the room there. Um, and you I know, said suddenly... that before we recorded, you got to give uh, people context. Oh, 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 oh sorry. <laughs> yeah. So you, you, you were commentating on the room, <laughs> mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, I mean, I've heard it, uh, you know, that, uh, Shen Dandalu, I think it's called the, the short film. It's, uh, it's, it's hailed as, a uh, a surrealistic masterpiece. I think but Luis apparently... Buñuel and... Um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And apparently when they made the film, they were actually trying to make fun of surrealism. They, that was their kind of intention, is we're going to poke fun at surrealism. But it was hailed It was hailed as a surrealistic masterpiece, so they kind of went with it. They were like, oh, yeah, I great. I thought their point was true surrealism means it doesn't have meaning. And they didn't want... they. They didn't like that artists were putting out things that had meaning. And in their mind, if it's truly surreal, it has no meaning. I think from what I remember, that's what they were saying. Um, and they their point was nothing they did have meaning and you're just trying to put meaning into it. And they didn't have, nothing they did was intended to lead from one thing to another. It was just random things that they did and it was completely meaningless. And I think that was that was her point. It's more so like um, nihilistic view, maybe. Um, yeah. and as opposed to like David Lynch, where he does surreal stuff, but it can have meaning into the plot and the story. With what they were doing with Unchen Andalu was just completely meaningless scenes put together, but still people found meaning in those scenes. Yeah. And I think they were happy about that. <laughs> I think they Yeah, were I mean, they're two like pompous geniuses. One was an artist and one was a filmmaker. Who were the two of the people that made that? I know one's a famous artist and one was a famous filmmaker that came together to make that short film. So um, I think it's 
Buñuel, I think. I could be wrong. It's Dali, Salvador Dali, maybe? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yes. Salvador Dali and who? It's an artist Salvador Dali and a filmmaker that did um, Un Chunandalu. And it's famous for the famous eyeball cutting scene um, in the movie. Yes. That's what people always talk about. Yeah. Are you, have you just learned to use Google? You're spending a long time getting the name of these. <laughs> yes, well, I'm having, was having difficulty spelling Google's it. new team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think it's um, Un, U-N, Chen, C-H-I-E-N. Yes, yeah. yeah. It's a 1929 French-Spanish surrealist short film directed, produced, and edited by Spanish filmmaker Louis Bunuel who also co-wrote the screenplay with the Spanish surrealist painter, Salvador Dali. Oh, uh, yeah, Pinoel and Dali. That's what I said, right? Or no? Yeah, that's what you said, yeah. Okay, okay. So you were um, correct. Yeah, I love that short. I love that short. I got lucky with the names because uh, it was hard to think on the spot. Um, but so I try to think of myself as a very open-minded, um, as I was watching this movie and realizing that I didn't love it, you know, I, I again, I yeah. like this movie, but I was expecting to love it. And I was realizing, you know what, I have to be more open minded, as open minded as I think I am. When I think of like, um, uh, a certain, you know, silent films, I only think of certain filmmakers or certain genres. When I think of, you know, certain genres, I only think of certain directors, but, and even when I, so when I think of, I, I'm like, yeah, I watch movies from all cultures, all countries. But then when I think of like Swedish filmmakers and Swedish films, there's only one person I think of. It's um, Igmar Bergman. Mm -hmm. So it's like, am I really that, you know, cultured if I can only think of one filmmaker from Sweden? And then when I think of Japanese films, I think of Kira Kurosawa. I mean, in all of Japan, I only know one filmmaker. So as much as I think I'm cultured and I like, oh, I watch all films from... I don't really watch that much in the great scheme of things. And um, there was one other filmmaker that, um, and from Japan I watched, uh, is uh, Kinji Fukasaku? 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 I think that's his name. Um, but I think he directed, um, what's that movie The Hunger Games was based on? Battle Royale. So he directed Battle oh, yeah. Royale. He's the other J Japanese filmmaker I, I was aware of. He directed Battle Royale. He did this series of movies called The Yakuza Papers. And I love nice. The Yakuza Papers. Just nonstop fucking action everywhere. You don't even need the subtitles. It's just action, action, action. It's just like a series of like five movies that he did. There, I highly recommend it. Um, but those okay. were the only two Japanese filmmakers I watched. And as I'm watching this, I'm like, you know what? I don't really know that much about Japanese filmmaking. Um, because even when I thought that, uh, when I saw this was Yakuza, that's the first thing that came to mind was him. But his film is a far different style than this, but he also had the Yakuza in his movies as well. Um, but it made me realize I'm not as cultured as I think I am. And it also made me think of like other Japanese filmmakers, those two being them. And, and this is, I guess, is the third Japanese filmmaker I'm formally introduced to. I'm sure I've seen maybe other Japanese film here and there, but I'm not familiar with who made it or anything like that. Um, but yeah, this, is, this evidently is kind of a, a studio director that did this and mm -hmm. um i think he his career got a little derailed because he sued a studio that he was working for for money dispute or something like that um but i mean he's he's a good director i mean in the commentary we watched or i watched i think you watched it too he was just saying like he he tried to make you know um chicken salad out of chicken shit and based on what he was saying his limitations are I think this is pretty good because um, from my understanding, how I interpreted what he was saying was that the studio had this hit song, they had this matinee idol, and they that was all their concern was, this is going to be a hit song, this is a guy we're trying to push as a movie star, make something out of this. And for those um, circumstances and limitations, I think he did a great job. Now, I don't have to, as a filmmaker give a shit about what his circumstances are. I just have to say if I like the movie or not. But as a fellow filmmaker and as someone who's trying to look at this in an analytical way, 
based on his circumstances, I think he did a brilliant job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, he's he's a really interesting guy, and uh, I think he's an example of, again, you know, to come back to the idea of the artist, but he's kind of like an artist working within a commercial system, you know, because he actually started out as an assistant director working for a smaller studio, and then uh, he got a chance to move over to Nikatsu, which was a big studio. And uh, they were hiring a lot of people sort of post-World War II, they were kind of rebuilding. And, uh, and so they hired a lot of good sort of assistant directors and gave them an opportunity to become directors. And, uh, and he was one of those people. And so he started making films for them and he, he made several films for them that I think were more traditional in the sense, uh, you know, they were traditional Yakuza films, but he started to kind of do uh, more unusual things. He, he was finding ways to be creative within those films. And uh, actually his bosses at Nikatsu didn't really like that. You know, they just wanted, they wanted very basic sort of Yakuza films that they could market. They had an audience and he was doing bizarre visual things. And, uh, and they were trying to say, hey, don't do that. So when it came time to make Tokyo Drifter, uh, they actually gave him less of a budget because they were hoping that would make it harder for him to be weird. And they wanted him to just kind of stick to the, the story as written. But it actually kind of had the opposite effect. And uh, he, he and his art director, uh, Takeo Kimura, uh, they really pushed themselves because they had limited budgets. So they really pushed and they, they reached new heights of surrealism and absurdity with this film. So um, the company was not impressed. And they actually, after this, they, they took away color film from him and they made him work in black and white. So <laughs> trying to stop him from doing all these interesting things with color, which he does in this movie. This movie really has a lot of interesting color uh, going on. Um, so, you know, but they still, you know, he found ways to kind of make these movies his own. And, and that they did wind up firing him and uh, essentially kind of almost blacklisting him in the industry. Like he didn't really work for about 10 years. And I think that's why he sued them as you alluded to before. Um, but I think after that, he kind of just made mostly independent films and he had some success with that. But, but he was like a guy who wanted to express himself artistically, sort of like a, uh, maybe a David Lynch or somebody like that who who had his ideas and he was trying to get them in there, even though his job was really just to make a straight ahead Yakuza film. Yeah, he even mentioned Akira Kurosawa as well. He's like, listen, we don't get to rehearse. Unless you're Akira Kurosawa, you don't get to <laughs> rehearse. You just gotta shoot the movie and get it done very quickly, you know? Um, so yeah, he had uh, immense limitations and based on his limitations, his achievements, are very commendable. And you're talking yeah. about here the 60s where color is a new thing. And you did have a lot of directors experiment with very colorful films. I think around this era, you had the birth of um, uh, the Italian uh, giallo films, which used mm -hmm. color a lot. You had Hitchcock, who, you know, when his color became a thing, exploded and, and used color as part of his plots and his stories. He used colors to tell his movies, basically. Um, and you had the filmmaker who did Peeping Tom. I forget his name. Yes. But Colors was, yes, Colors was huge in in his films. So um, when I, the man I saw the Colors, I'm like, yeah, this is a 60s film, <laughs> you know, because it's <laughs> like, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's a new toy. It's kind of like, you know, like maybe about 10 years ago when 3D became a big thing again with Avatar, you know, it's just like, it's a new toy that filmmakers have to play with, you know, or be even further back when HD, T, HD became a thing, you know, as technology progresses and these filmmakers have new toys, or even before this with sound, you know, you get the, the filmmakers that just, you know, they either shy away from it, they're scared of it, or they embrace it and they just, they just, you know, use it to tell their stories even better and use it as a storytelling device. And uh, I think he definitely did that with this. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, they say that it kind of fits into the 60s avant-garde movement as much as it fits into the Yakuza genre. 
or any other genre. It kind of touches on a lot of different genres, um, including musicals. Um, Did we say what his, his name is? We keep calling him. Uh, yes, Seijon Suzuki. Seijon Suzuki. Uh, so yeah, Suzuki, he, he really seemed to take influence from a lot of different genres in making this film. Um, this feels like a Western now, honestly. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the things I kept thinking. It felt like a Western. Uh, but there's also the musical aspects. They keep singing this song, and we we see him singing it as he's walking around in the real but world. But wasn't that it's... like a mandate for him? It, because <laughs> I think the song was like, we got a great song. Let's just try to, instead of doing a music video, let's just do a movie to promote the song. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, I'm not sure whether they knew he was going to sing it in such a way or, you know, I mean, the woman sings it in the club, I believe. But then he kind of sings it to himself, and it's sort when of like that happened. I'm like, "What song. the fuck am I watching? Is this a musical <laughs> yeah. now?" Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it just exactly. came out of nowhere, and I was yeah. like, "All right, be open minded." I love the yeah. Big Lebowski, and they had a song, song and yes. dance number out of nowhere. When he yeah. started singing, I'm like, "What the fuck is going on with this movie?" Yes. <laughs> oh yes. There were many times I wondered what was going on with this movie. It was. Um, it's so all know, over the place, dude. Yeah. I mean, going in knowing nothing, I was just like, whoa, what's going on? And it's one of these movies, though, that I think that after you watch it and you maybe watch some extras or you read some articles, you kind of appreciate it more once you kind of understand, oh, yeah, that's what he was doing here. And that's what his intention was. Um, but the first watch, it's just kind of it's like, whoa, what am I looking at? You just don't you don't know how to get into it in a way, except maybe the moments that you know really strike you with the color or the cinematography or um you know there were moments that definitely were interesting yeah but, uh, that's why i compared it to house and um curse yeah. of a teenage nazis because sometimes when you go into a movie blind it's just the excitement of not knowing but also the disappointment because you don't know where to set your expectations so much of enjoying something is setting proper expectations and yeah. when you go in blind, you don't know where your expectations should be. So you're just naturally disappointed if it's not the greatest thing you've ever seen. So over time, you definitely appreciate it more. And I think I'll yeah. appreciate this movie more the further I am away from watching it. Yeah, exactly. Um, I always think about this thing that I once saw on a science show where they, they handed somebody an ice cream cone you know, big scoop of vanilla ice cream. And they said, here, taste this. And the guy tasted it and he made this face like it was disgusting and he kind of spit it out. And uh, they said, what's wrong? And he said, this isn't ice cream. This is mashed potatoes. And they said, well, don't you like mashed potatoes? And he said, well, yeah, I love mashed potatoes, but I wasn't expecting it. I was expecting ice cream. So he, he was disgusted, even though he actually likes mashed potatoes. And that's kind of what I think this is, you know, you're sort of like, you're thrown because it's not what you expect. And yeah, I think once you know, you might have a better experience watching and it. And I again. think I just made that point before you. <laughs> I think you did, <laughs> but I'm backing you up with science. This was a science show. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yes. But yeah, there's, um, yeah, the, the colors in this movie is great. And, um, yeah, again, when I first saw this, before I heard the commentary, I was like, all right, this is an art film. And like, let me embrace it as an art film. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously we're going to get to further along you go with this movie. That's when it really hit me like, all right, this is really just a Western in a way. Um, because mm -hmm. they really embraced the Western tropes, you know, the guy without yes. a name, the lone gunfighter, um, the mythology of him, you know and the yeah. betrayal and him coming back and coming back into town the showdown and all that stuff so heavily mm -hmm. influenced by it and i think it must have been a thing in japanese culture where where they were influenced by westerns because kurosawa himself was heavily influenced by westerns and john ford yeah i think so and often when i watch a japanese film particularly from the 70s or maybe the 60s the music often reminds me of spaghetti western music you know there's a similarity there i think they well, were that's more italian right it's more, more italian American. but it's still western you know the western mythology um but yeah 
I don't think they copied off of the Italians. The Italians <laughs> copied off of everything. The Italian uh, movies in the 60s and 70s were such copycat movies. True enough. Any genre I think that it, came out, they just like do a bootleg version of it. Yeah. I think it if went it wasn't for ways. Sergio Le Leone legitimizing um, spaghetti westerns, it would have just been like this um, exploitation type stuff. A lot of exploitation stuff came out of Italian filmmakers. True enough. Um, one thing that Suzuki talked about you is... You don't have to agree um, with me. <laughs> I, no, I don't. I don't have to agree with you. Um, <laughs> you don't argue with but, me much. I, no. I, sometimes I may just... Uh, I, I, you know what I may do one time? is just throw out like an insane theory that's just completely crazy and just yeah. see if you say, true enough, and just keep, keep going. <laughs> or if you say, what the hell are you talking about? Well, I think we did. You did that once, didn't you? And uh, uh, all about Eve, perhaps you had a theory in there, which uh, I did argue with you about. And because uh, uh, you love that movie, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I don't but, remember what um, I said, but I know you love that movie. Um, yeah, well, I think you said Eve was the main character. Oh, that got you riled up. Huh? <laughs> it did. Yeah. But that's another I still movie, believe so that we, yeah but that's we it. shouldn't dwell on that too much but no. um but uh, yeah i was just going to say that um suzuki one of the things he talked about was that you know his movies were basically b movies so they were meant to be the second movie in a double bill and so the a movie would have a certain style and they would be shot in a certain way and he felt that as a b movie he he had to be different from that because if he just did the same thing, it's just going to be an inferior version of the A movie. So he would find a different way of shooting a scene or of portraying something. And so that might be one reason why he came up with some really bizarre things here to distinguish himself from the A film that he might have been paired with. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, I mean, um, this movie has a twist that comes later on. It just came, it felt like it came out of nowhere. It didn't feel like an earned twist. Uh, what did you think about the twist that comes later? On in this movie? <laughs> I was like, well, that's where they're going? Like, you saw it coming based on, like, what the character said before it happened. But um, I'm glad it came, because otherwise it, the movie would have just been too straightforward, because it kind of meanders for a while of like certain like vignettes are uh, you know like gets real repetitive um what did you think uh, about the twist in the movie well um uh, which twist are you referring to <laughs> you well i guess we might as well spoil it so you know what i'm talking about yeah um uh, where the um his boss turns on him right yeah okay it's the only twist in the movie what, what yeah did well I well i i didn't even see it as a twist because it just seemed like yeah, it was sort of inevitable, you know. Um, really? It, yeah. Before, I mean, the other guy... before the other character told him, like, you shouldn't be so loyal. Like, when he said yeah. you shouldn't be so loyal, I'm like, oh, okay, his boss is going to turn on him. Before he said that, I didn't see any indication his boss was going to turn on him. You did? Well, I mean, I think it's in the in the the fact that it's so, you know, they're, they're so supportive of each other or whatever you want to call it i thought it's he like, was going to get killed and he'd come back to avenge him i thought that's well, what they that's, were setting uh, up yeah i mean that's a possibility but you know they're both so determined not to betray each other that it just seems like okay it's a bit like a gun on the wall you know they're 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 so loyal to each other but who's maybe got one of, uh yeah check has gun on the wall it's like <laughs> they're they're so loyal Mm -hmm. that maybe that's that's the issue here is uh, maybe you saw it coming reason. then you're a writer i don't know but yeah i didn't well. see it coming i thought that it was gonna they were so loyal to each other and he the only reason he left town was to protect his boss i thought yeah. oh when they kill his boss he's gonna come back to avenge out of loyalty instead of getting away yeah. um i didn't see the betrayal because i didn't see any indication that they didn't make his boss out to be a great character you know, no. just his boss that he was loyal to. So. Yeah. Well, I think I was surprised the boss wasn't killed like in the first 10 minutes or 20 minutes. You know, I just thought that things are going to go bad and everybody's going to be killed. And then he's going to be this 
drifter, this Tokyo drifter that they promised us. And, and that's another interesting thing is that they describe him as the Tokyo drifter. And he know, calls himself the, the Phoenix, though. Throughout the whole yeah, movie, the Phoenix. the Phoenix. Then yeah. they force in the drifter thing out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. But in the descriptions of the movie, before you even watch it, they talk about him being the drifter who drifts around. But that really doesn't come until like the last third of the movie where he's drifting and he doesn't really drift that much either no. it's not really i don't think it's a very accurate description of the movie well it's an accurate description of the song that's what the yes. movie's about is the song <laughs> it's, a it's almost like yeah. they have a movie called the phoenix but they have this song called the drifter so they're like oh no no he's not the phoenix he's the drifter and then <laughs> let's just make it we'll make it work we'll make it work in editing so uh one thing that struck me um the name of the character, our, our hero, uh, Tetsuya Phoenix Tetsu Hondo. <laughs> uh, first of all, the, the actor's name is also Tetsuya, which is interesting. So I don't know if they named the character after him, but they shorten it to Tetsu often when they talk about him, they say Tetsu. And then there's this other character in the movie whose name is actually shortened to Tatsu which is almost identical. There's just one letter difference there. And I found that confusing during some of the scenes, they would be talking about Tatsu and I would think they were talking about Tetsu. I would think it was the same character. Um, so yeah, you know what confused me? Choice. No. When he started singing here, I'm like, what the fuck am I watching? <laughs> well, that is true. Yes, the singing was uh, a surprise, you know. And that scene kind of reminded me of Christine. When her burning yes. Car. Yeah. But yeah, yes. this was, I mean, we talked about this singing before, but this is actually us seeing him sing for the first time. And this was yes. like, wait a minute, is this a musical? Like yeah. 30 minutes into the movie, it's a musical <laughs> now. Like, what the hell? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's certainly, if I didn't think it was surrealistic before that, I certainly thought so after that. The movie was entering a new level of surrealism. Um, but yeah, it's like he adopted the song as his theme because it's the same song we hear in the nightclub earlier. Yeah. And it's weird how this guy becomes his arch nemesis. What well, you would think it was the guy who had his girlfriend killed, right? Cause it was the other guy who got his girlfriend killed. Yeah. So um, was it the guy who got yeah. his eye shot out? Was the guy who had his girlfriend killed in the big shootout? Oh man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right no worries no worries man Don't the worry plot is it. a little bit confusing so um <laughs> there is no plot uh, where you can i was by? so he is tetsu the phoenix yes he says um yeah so interesting choice of names mm -hmm. um but the, the the girlfriend the singer in the club i always love scenes like that where the, the main bad guy just lashes out and beats up a henchman. Yeah. It seems like that never gets old. It's like, <laughs> why would you ever want to be a bad guy in a movie? You're That's just right. like, you're it's just like there to be a punching bag. <laughs> it's uh, a toxic work environment, being a bad guy. It is. It, is, it yeah. really is. <laughs> See, they're talking even about when I was a kid, and... even when I was a kid with like Thundercats and yeah. um, the way the, um, Mumra used to lash out at the mutants or like uh, with Transformers where Starscreen always used to get, you know, ragged on or, you know, yeah. just anytime I see scenes like those in movies, it always gets me. It's like, yeah. can I ever be a villain? It, yeah. it, I don't know if you ever watch wrestling too, but wrestling is, there used to be such cartoon characters. Like when yeah. Hulk Hogan became a bad guy in NWO, anytime okay. he'd lose, he'd be like, listen, brother. There's only one reason I lost that fight, brother. And he'd have like eight goons in the back, and he just turned around and randomly pick one of them. And we all know it's your fault, brother. And then that one goon would be like, oh shit. <laughs> and the other goons would be like, thank God he didn't point at me. And then they'd all beat up the one guy. <laughs> He's like, now that that cancer's out of the way, brother, time for me to kick your ass. But uh, I just love the bad guy not being accountable and just like, blaming his goons so yeah that scene I, I enjoyed that one yeah 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 classic b-movie goodness yeah for sure and asian sim is great for that 
because I mean it was I mean it wasn't um Japanese filmmaking, but it was Chinese um with the um the Shaw brothers. Oh yeah. Oh my god. Like my uncle made me watch a lot of those movies as a kid. They come on like Sunday matinee movies. Um they'd all be dubbed and they play on the weekends in the afternoons and the mornings. And um you always have the zoom. The quick zoom and the bad guy just like <laughs> and just like laughing, his eyes bulging, and those goons yeah. were just like, oh, 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 yeah, and they just start laughing. <laughs> <laughs> they did. Yes. Oh God. Do you remember um, what was that movie? Across 110th Street. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Great movie. The um, the uh, the gangster in that movie. Hopefully, people get all these references I'm making. <laughs> um because i'm going off on the tangent the main gangster guy in that movie who was marrying into the mob and oh, yes. um he had to like he had to prove himself and then he had the, he was hunting out the black guys who stole from the mob and you steal from the mob it's not robbery it's suicide <laughs> across 110th street <laughs> so he's hunting them down and he's like yes. he's like uh yeah you know where the money is he's like i'm not gonna hurt you he's like i'm not let's go let's go oh no that's cool i'm not gonna <laughs> just like bad guys that bring the comedy to you know just like those psychopathic oh, yeah. bad guys that bring the comedy to it i was hoping we get more out yes. of that with this bad guy when he slapped him but after this he doesn't even become a main character anymore the main bad no. guy in this no it's like the bad guys all like because it seemed like it was all about the bad guy pushing our lead character over the edge to see what he's going to do. And I thought he was trying to push him for a reason, but there was real no reason why they're antagonizing him. I just don't get it. Like eventually it became a reason to get him to turn on his boss or whatever, but why they're antagonizing him, I never got. But I thought that that bad guy would be developed more and there would be like some kind of like, you know, like rivalry with them, but he kind of takes a back seat and then our lead character just fights like random henchmen and vignette after vignette after vignette. Yeah. And the movie just doesn't go anywhere. Well, you're looking for logical linear storytelling. That, that's not what's going on here. It's, this is something else. It's, this is surrealism. This is, this is weirdness. You know, this is deliberately different from the other movies. Yeah. So yeah, I guess I'm describing the movie kind of... I wish I saw instead yeah. of the movie yeah. I did see. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yes, there were lots of things I expected to see that I did not see. Um, yeah, it's a real puzzle, and I felt like it jumped around at times, and uh, read later that uh, partly because of budgetary reasons that some connecting moments weren't shot or couldn't be shot so the movie kind of jumps around a little bit at times and it's hard to figure out how did i get from here to here in certain moments mm -hmm. um, but it just kind of adds to that surrealistic feel so once you kind of accept that that's what it is then perhaps you can start enjoying it yeah i mean watching this scene here it's hard to think that later on that guy is our main villain he's like yeah. oh let me cut you an apple and make you a meal it's like <laughs> That's that yes. guy's our main villain. Because it again, part of me that it doesn't make sense is the whole movie starts off, right? With our lead character doesn't want to be a Kuzma anymore because his mm -hmm. boss says, All right, we're going straight. And the boss is like, All right, don't fight back. Let's just go straight. We're going to do this the honest way. We're leaving the cr criminal life behind. Don't go over the edge. And for me, it's like, All right, his boss wants him to go straight. It's not his call. He's loyal to his boss. When his boss gets killed, that's when he says, screw it. I'm just going to yeah. be the old me who I used to be. The phoenix is going to rise, and I'm going to show these guys who they've been pushing. That, to me, seemed like the logical way for this to go. And you got this henchman who has his bright, colorful outfit. He always has his sunglasses on. Even in the middle of a fight, when his sunglasses go on, he's like, oh, my glasses, give me my glasses. He's like, puts his glasses <laughs> back on. And it's just like, I'm like, this is going to be this cartoonish villain that our hero is going to then like go after. And and this villain is going to be like blaming his henchmen and smacking them around and sending yeah. them out one by one to get killed. And he's like, he's still alive, like a John Wick or something. He just keeps coming at him. 
So that's the movie I had playing out in my head after like the first 15, 20 minutes or so. And then when I got what we ended up getting, you're just like, what? Huh? <laughs> like, really? Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, right from the start, it's kind of a little bit odd because... Like you said, they're supposedly going straight. They're not going to be Yakuza anymore. But I'm not sure why that equates to when a bunch of guys start beating you up, you're not allowed to defend yourself. I mean, there's there's a big difference between being a Yakuza, being a gangster, you know, being a criminal and defending yourself when somebody starts hitting you out on the street. You know, I, I you know, it's it's an extreme kind of definition of oh i can't fight back because i'm no longer part of that violent yakuza world so i'm just going to take it it almost seems religious in a way it seems like a weird i don't know christian or buddhist or something idea you know that i will not fight back even if they beat me to death you know because i am making a point or something but um you know that doesn't necessarily to me seem like something you would have to do just because you're going straight so right away it kind of feels a little bit off you know this isn't quite a normal movie there's something that feels a little bit strange about that to me um, and then it just gets weirder after that yeah well i made sense of that in my head to say this character is renounced in violence so when he does get yeah. violence that contrast will be stark here we have this guy who wouldn't fight back to now this guy who's killing like everyone, you know? I thought they were just trying to build yeah. contrast and to show like, all right, you know, he went from this to that um, after his boss gets killed or there's some kind of inciting incident that gets him over the edge, yeah. maybe his girlfriend getting killed or something like that. Um, but I just saw that as a logical way to go. That's why I thought it, you know, why would his boss be the bad guy? His boss wanted to leave that life. His boss yeah. wanted to go straight. Like, why is his yeah. boss suddenly the main bad guy of the movie? I mean, but you said you yeah. it made sense to you, but for me, it didn't make sense because <laughs> the movie starts off with saying his boss doesn't want to be a criminal anymore. So, mm -hmm. and his boss made him not be a criminal anymore. It's not like his boss says, I'm going straight. You guys do what you want. He's like, I'm going straight. I want you guys to go straight. Oh, by the way, screw that. I'm going to go, I'm going to become a criminal again. And I'm going to kill you. It's like, what? Like, <laughs> it didn't make any sense, you know? Yeah. And here's this guy yeah. who's not just loyal to you that he goes straight, but he's so loyal to you. He takes the rap for your murder. Like he takes <laughs> the onus. He takes the responsibility for that. He's the last guy you should want to get killed, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But there's something that feels traditional about that to me, though. You know, somebody who's so loyal and does everything that their boss asks. And then in the end, they are rewarded in that way. They're betrayed. Like that seems like such a classic story to me. It doesn't seem hard to believe. Like you kind of see it coming because, oh yeah, this guy, he's being a good guy. He's doing all the right things, but he's gonna pay the price for that in the end. It's like when a group of criminals are arrested and one of them turns on the others, you know, because he sees it as his way out, you know, this is the only way he can somehow get out of this situation is to turn on the Phoenix, you know, Tetsu. Um, so, you know, it doesn't make sense in a way, but it also does make sense in a way, as much as anything makes sense in this movie. No, what you're saying sounds logical if his boss didn't say, I want to go straight and I want yeah. you guys to go straight with me. Then what you're saying makes sense. But the fact that his boss went straight makes it make less sense. If his boss was still a criminal or if his boss was doing things to take advantage of him, kind of like how we saw um, I'm a Fugitive from a Chain Gang, where it's just like very much like a message movie. It's a very manipulative movie where it's trying to get you on the side of the hero. A way to get us on the side of the hero is to put him in a position that makes him vulnerable and makes us empathize with him. Where it's like, we have this boss that keeps taking advantage of us. Like, yeah, I can relate to that. My boss takes advantage of me all the time. I'm so, I'm so loyal, I'm such a good employee, but he's just not fair to me. And he could have had, we could have had a boss who's constantly taking advantage of him. And he keeps trying to be loyal, be loyal, be loyal until he finally wakes up and says, you know what? No, enough is enough. But 
that's not how this played out, you know? And even terrible no. employees feel that way. You can have the worst employee of the world. They're going to paint a picture. And, no, I'm the best. What do you mean? So what if I sleep at work? I get tired sometimes, you know? It's like, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But uh, it, yeah. that's a story that people can go with. But the setup just didn't make sense. I don't know. At least yeah. to me it didn't. And here we have our matinee idol singing again. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, well, you know, it didn't make sense. I mean, it, it's kind of a strange beginning again, you know, because it seems to me that, again, when we're comparing it to Westerns, like he's the legendary gunfighter, you know, the Phoenix, Tetsu. He's, he, they don't, they're afraid of him. You know, he's such a dangerous character that they don't want to move on the organization. Even though the organization is disbanded, the boss is no longer a criminal. They're afraid to move on him because of Tetsu. So it, it seems, I mean, that's kind of absurd in itself because just one man doesn't really make a whole lot of difference, I don't think, in the real world. But but he's like almost a superhero, Yakuza. And so they're afraid that he's going to fight back and he's going to be a problem. So that's why they're testing him in the beginning by attacking him and beating him, <laughs> which just, the whole thing just seems We're so of, scared of you, we're going to beat you up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're going to see if you fight back, you know. And, I mean, if he did, what would they do then at that point? They'd be in trouble, yeah. I guess. But um, yeah. It's like, yeah, I it hate lions. Like... I'm so scared of lions. I'm going to go yeah. beat that lion up just to <laughs> see if it, it'll yeah. actually attack me. Yes. I want the lion's owner, but I'm afraid the lion might attack me. So let me test it out by beating the lion and kicking the lion. And <laughs> Oh, apparently the lion's a coward, so I can go ahead and kill his boss or his owner. Um, yeah, it's it's it seems... The whole thing was a little bit, as I said, a little bit off or a little bit surreal right from the start. And then, yeah, it just kind of keeps going and gets weirder. And he is sort of like a, a roving gunfighter or something. Yeah. Um, I think what helps around. surreal movies, I think the best surreal movies are shorts. Like Unchen Andalu or like, I don't know if these mm -hmm. would be categorized as surreal movies, but like um, Meshes of the Afternoon things like yes. that um those are the best yeah the other good ones mm -hmm. um they are really over the top they compact the movie with surreal action this will have like 20 minutes straight where it feels like a regular movie then suddenly some weird shit happens and be like all right what what's going on you know it's not mm -hmm. weird enough in a way like house mm -hmm. house house yeah. had some weird shit happening every five seconds either the way it was shot or edited things the characters would say or do or what's happening on the screen it was just wall-to-wall -wall nonsense and they were just throwing everything at you this just has surreal moments you know and in other yeah. times it just feels like a yakuza film other times it feels like a western other times it feels like a musical it just has no identity yeah. Well, I guess that too, that's a byproduct of the fact that he was supposed to deliver a product, which was a very straight ahead Yakuza film. And so he's got to kind of stick to that a little bit, but he's finding ways to shoehorn in these other ideas that he's more interested in, you know, so it, it kind of resembles a, a Yakuza film for a while. And then suddenly something weird happens, you know, he's singing or, or something else is happening. That's just weird. So Perhaps if he had been allowed to just do whatever he wanted, maybe this would be more wall-to-wall -wall surrealism. Maybe it would have nothing to do with Yakuza, even. I don't know. But he was kind of trying to do what he wanted to do within this box that he had been put in. And it, it kind of makes you think this might be what uh, Return of the Jedi or whatever had, had been like if... Uh, if David Lynch had agreed to direct it, you know, maybe he would have shoehorned in some really bizarre moments there that wouldn't resemble the Star Wars movie. But in fairness, though, with the restrictions he had, this was his best reviewed film or like maybe not at the time. But when you look yeah. back at his filmography, like this is the only movie that's really cited as being like a must watch from this filmmaker, you know? Well, I think this one and Branded to Kill, which he made 
I think it was two movies after this one. And I think that's the one that finally got him fired. <laughs> um, it's one of the black and white ones after they took color away from him. And I haven't seen it, I must admit. But, um, but I think that one people talk about uh, really admiringly. And it obviously went far enough that they decided that's it for you. And they fired him. Yeah. Yeah, the thing about this, when I, when I saw this movie, while well, I was watching this movie, you know, a few days ago, whenever it was, I thought about something that I heard this radio personality say, like I was, I was into sports radio at the time, like, um, and I was listening to this guy talk about Eyes Wide Shut. Stanley Kubrick recently died. Stanley Kubrick is kind of a cult director. He's not like a mainstream name in a lot of circles. He's more like a filmmaker's filmmaker. Um, you know, people love The Shining and things like that, but they think of Jack Nicholson and stuff like that. So, um, they were talk. So, the, I said that to say that after he died, he got more eyes on his film than probably should have been on his film. And what I mean by that is, commercial films have a broad appeal because they don't offend anybody. It's very homogenized. It's made in a corporate type of way where it's meant to appease everyone. It's not meant to be, generally commercial films aren't meant to be like, this group of people are gonna think it's great. Because to get this group of people to think it's great, this group of people are gonna think it sucks. To be loved, you're gonna be hated. So I think like commercial movies are meant to be like, everyone thinks it's okay. No one dislikes it, you know? Because to really get someone heated and like, man, I love this, Someone's going to be like, ah, oh, no, I hate it, you know? So it's not meant to be great to anyone, just like kind of okay to everyone. So that's those are the type of movies that get a wide audience. Kubrick movies are not those type of movies. Kubrick movies, they play out in a way that's going to offend people. It's like, well, this isn't the way you tell a story. Like, what's the point of this? Why is he holding on this shot? What sense does this make? It doesn't appeal to everyone. And that's by design. So when he died, Eyes Wide Shut got exposed to people who normally wouldn't even watch a Kubrick film, people who maybe even heard of Kubrick, but his death got that movie eyes that it shouldn't have got, which I think got that movie a lot of backlash. And a lot of people were saying, including this radio person I was listening to, oh, like, you know, he made some good films, but, you know, people, they see an artist... And they just assume, oh, because it comes from this guy, it must be good. But this movie is a piece of crap, but some of his other movies are good. I'm like, shut the fuck up. Like, you know, you don't know what you're talking yeah. about. Eyes Wide Shut to me is one of Kubrick's best films. I'll, I'll go to my grave with that. But yeah. the point being is that um, you can't really get an artistic film I kind of lost where I was going with this analogy. I took so long with the analogy. It's all good dream. so far. <laughs> it sounds like I'm making a great point, right? Yeah, yeah it does. does. It's, a, it's going well. How does well. this circle back to this movie, though? Like, our, So my point is, you can't bring an artistic film to work. That's what it is. Okay, now I, I found myself again. I found okay. myself again. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so the point he was trying to make about Kubrick, I think could be made about this film. And sometimes something just looks so weird, you start projecting meaning on it. And you as a moviegoer, as a film critic, say, oh, this is a movie that no one's ever heard of. And it's so weird and odd. Let me start projecting meaning on it. Oh, I discovered this really cool, artistic, weird movie. And I think people are projecting greatness onto this movie that's not there because it's this niche movie that's not available to the wide audience like a commercial film is. They look at this and say, well, this doesn't have all the commercial cliches I see in other movies, which means it must be like something. This goes askew of all the conventional stuff that we've been talking about that we're like, oh, we expected this and we expected that. I could see film goers or film critics watching this and say, oh, this isn't going in the direction I expect it to be. It must be great. And I think that guy who was talking about Eyes Wide Shut is probably thinking of movies like this. 
where it's like, oh, you oh, you hear about this movie, you hear about this movie, and then you watch it, it's like, what the fuck are these critics talking about? Just show me a conventional movie, you know? And I think mm. this is where that falls into that category, for me at least, in that this movie was so hyped up as this must-watch artistic movie, and I watch it and it feels like a mess. It doesn't feel like art. It feels like a bunch of things pulling in different directions. Then when you see the director commentary, you realize he shot black and white because they needed to use up some cheap footage of black and white film reel. Oh, there's musical numbers because the studio wanted this to be all about the song. Oh, well, this ending looks like a fake movie set because they made him reshoot the ending because they didn't like the way the movie ended. And it's really just like this collage of an artistic filmmaker trying to make chicken salad out of chicken shit, but it's not really a great film. It's a great accomplishment, but this isn't a film of all the films that are made through cinema. I don't think this is a film that's like, man, we have to highlight this film as a must watch. I think it's good. I think knowing the backstory makes it better, but I don't think this film should be spotlighted the way it is with critics. Yeah, well, I don't disagree with you. I mean, uh, you know, you never disagree three. with me, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, except on all about Eve. That's where we that's have a, a disagreement. But um, yeah, I think that 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 is what you're describing. I mean, it's exactly it's like a Shandon Delu again. You know, where people they see something in it that wasn't really there to begin with, and uh, you know. That happens a lot, I think, with weird movies. And I think people are interested in discovering a new cult classic or a new weird movie. You know, I think there is some of that going on where people like to unearth something and say, hey, I just. And that's this. why we have this show. We watch yes. it so you don't have to. <laughs> that should be our new, our new slogan. Yeah. <laughs> you heard nice. some artistic shit. You don't know if it's good or it's bad. Let us watch it for you. We'll let you know if you should or you shouldn't. Or watch it along yeah. with us. It'll be more entertaining that way. Play the movie and play our audio track. Yeah. But, you know, what I don't know is if, if you know, we had been watching all of his movies from the beginning, you know, would we have started out with some fairly traditional movies that we would have said, yeah, this is good. This is good. I like this. And we would have kind of watched him grow into this. And maybe we would have... I don't know, had a different reaction to it or it would have meant more or something. Um, but it, to me, it's kind of like watching the most complicated thing before you've watched the basic things, you know, where maybe this isn't the right wi window into his career or his work. I don't know. You know, maybe there are other films that would have been more satisfying. Um, but, um, but unlike you, the rest of us didn't grow up in the 60s. So why should yeah, we go yeah. all the way back in the 60s <laughs> to follow the career of this director? A good director yeah. by all means, but there are directors that are like making good films now, you know? To me, when yeah. you go, because I, I was watching this um, this this YouTube channel, um, Grace Randolph, I think is her name. She does Beyond the Trailer or something. Oh, and yeah. she was talking about, oh, you know, people don't really watch old movies you know, and I was watching this, you know, classic movies from the 80s. And, you know, a lot of a lot of people haven't even heard of Batman 89. They don't know who Michael Keaton is. I'm like, bitch, are you fucking kidding me? An old movie to you is Batman 89? Like, what the yeah, fuck? Yeah. We just watched yeah. Battleship Potemkin. What are you yeah, talking about right. old movies? You know, it's like, yeah. and I'm thinking like, you know, like, it. it we're a, a rare breed. I mean, there are a lot of us, but I don't think we're as vast an audience as, you know, there, there is out there that find pleasure in just seeking out random old movies from different countries and, and different time periods and revisiting them. And if you're going to ask someone to say, here's a random movie made in Japan called Tokyo Drifter from 1966, that subtitle, if you're telling a common moviegoer who are so young or their scope of movies is so small 
that they never heard of Batman 89 and they don't know who Michael Keaton is, to get them to watch something like this may be a disservice in a way because mm -hmm. it's going to be like, oh, this is what I'm going to get if I watch old movies? No, I'll stick to my Fast and Furious Part 79 or whatever, you know? So yeah. to me, like, it's there's a certain duty you have as a lover of um, old movies and classic movies and just being like a film historian or being YouTube reviewers like us that we have a certain duty to filter out movies. And to me, this isn't necessarily a movie that really should be up in the category as some of the movies that we highlight on our channel. Yeah, And it's not a negative thing to say. Hundreds of movies are made every year across the world. It's not a negative thing to say that a movie made almost 60 years ago isn't necessarily a must watch from another a movie made 60 years ago on a budget from another country isn't necessarily a must watch for someone in the US today, you know? I don't think that's a knock yeah. on the movie, the people who made no. it, filmmaker or anything. No, I, I think it is a difficult movie. It's a complicated movie. It's uh, you know, it's not for everyone. I think there are some people who do love it. There are people who legitimately love this movie. And maybe they are people who are more schooled in the Yakuza tradition, who've kind of experienced the genre in depth and who can see things in this that makes them laugh or smile. And you know, maybe they recognize things that make it brilliant. Um, and I guess it's like watching a spoof of something, but you've never watched the original stuff that it's spoofing. So you don't know is this a good spoof or not, you know? Um, the scene that we're watching right now is one of the real Western kind of moments here where we're having a barroom brawl, um, almost like something out of Blazing Saddles, you could say. Um, That's exactly so, what I thought of. Yeah, yeah. And there's weird stuff going on there, like the two guys who are causing trouble, they take their pants off. <laughs> this is their way of starting trouble in the bar. A, this know. is this scene is where the movie officially lost me. Yeah. Because it was clear it wasn't choreographed. Like I've had a scene <laughs> like this in one of my movies where it's just like, all right, guys, just go wild for like as yeah. long as you can. And yeah. this doesn't feel choreographed. It doesn't feel like a serious movie. Like it worked in Blazing Saddles because it's a comedy breaking the fourth wall. Yeah. But this is in the context of the movie itself. This isn't breaking the fourth wall. And it just feels no. unchoreographed. Like yeah. the fight scenes look really fake because it's just one wide shot that they're using. I mean, if it was choreographed, they could be able to cut back and forth because the actors would be doing the same thing in every take. Yeah. But this is just one wide uh -huh. shot. Go crazy, guys. This <laughs> scene, the movie lost me, but this yeah. scene also had my favorite moment, moment in the movie. So the other mythical character, the shooting star, mm -hmm. when he's fighting, you guys can pause this if you're going to rewatch the movie. He's fighting under a stage and it collapses and it's clear it collapsed on his head yeah. because just before they cut this fake, it's obviously <laughs> fake wood, but it's just about to smack him in the face. Then they cut to the next take. I don't know if you noticed it, but I noticed no. it right away. And I was no, like, I that's didn't. hilarious. He just got <laughs> smacked in the face. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, when I saw this, like an unchoreographed, like, you know, like you said, it, it does have the feel of like a, a Western brawl or like, um, or, or like uh, Blazing Saddles. But again, yeah, in the context of this, it just took me out of taking anything serious in the movie anymore, you know? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, again, maybe, maybe if we were really experts on Yakuza films, maybe we would see things in here that we would go, oh my God, that's brilliant. You know, that's a brilliant moment. That's a reference to this. Or, He's poking fun at that. Um, I'm, I'm not, not sure. an expert in Yakuza films, but I saw, I mean, I saw the Yakuza papers, that five series movies. Oh yes. And yeah. I also, I mean, I'm a fan of gangster films and that's essentially what yeah. Yakuza is. It's just a Japanese mob, you know? So yes. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
it's hard to say, but I do know that, I mean, I don't consider myself an expert on Japanese cinema at all. Um, it's one area that I feel somewhat deficient in. Um, and I know that, um, you know, there are things just because the culture is so different, there are things that we as Westerners don't get the same way that they would get in Japan. And, um, uh, and most of, uh, Suzuki's films were just kind of in Japan. Like they didn't really travel the world the way some films did. They were mainly marketed in Japan. And it wasn't until years later with home video that they started to leak some of them out like this one and branded to kill. And they started to find that international audience, but, but they were really made for a Japanese audience. And I'm sure there are things in here that the Japanese audience may understand that I don't, you know, that maybe lots of other people in the West don't, um, which could be another factor. But I, yeah, I wonder, you know, if, if we had watched one of his earlier films, whether that would have been a more satisfying You keep experience. wondering that. If you're trying to I talk know. me into watching more of his movies, <laughs> it's not going to work. That's like the third time you mentioned that. Yes. Like, I'm not yeah. hearing you. I'm ignoring you. I heard you. Well, you're, not, you're not taking me up on it, so I got to keep no. mentioning it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I agree. It's not just time, but it's, it's time and space. It's not just yeah. that it's in another country. It's in another time. It's from 1966, so... Of course, yeah. a lot of it's going to be lost in us. We can just do what we can, talk about things that we know, you know, the mm -hmm. stuff about color being a big thing around the 60s, yes. um, you know, the research we did, the commentary tracks we heard, the history we have of watching movies, you know, even he brought up Kurosawa. We've seen other Kurosawa movies. So we yeah. know, like, how a big budget Japanese movie looks around that time. So, I mean, we can only put in the context we have, but our context, yeah. you're right, it's very limited Yeah. to fully understand. Yeah. And apparently the Yakuza films, they, they sort of have their roots in the silent era, although they were a little different then, uh, but they kind of portrayed sympathetic Robin Hood-like characters, I guess, outlaws who were basically good. And then it was after World War II that they kind of changed a little bit and became a little bit more like, well, not quite like what we're seeing here, but but uh, more of the modern Yakuza film, uh, which did take some inspiration from the Hollywood gangster films. Um, and uh, it's interesting, if you look at a list of Yakuza films on uh, Wikipedia, they include things that aren't even Japanese necessarily, like uh, Sidney Pollock's film, The Yakuza from 1975, I don't know if you've seen that film. Uh, I actually thought it was pretty good. Uh, Ridley Scott's Black Rain from 1989, which I don't think I ever saw. Um, and uh, even The Punisher from 1989 makes it to the list. And I know I did see that. I don't remember the Yakuza elements particularly. but They were uh, in there, yeah. Yeah. But what's really interesting to me... You know what was funny? The Yakuza was in the Punisher movie that Dolph Lundgren did. Well, you yes. know what wasn't in the Punisher movie Tal Lundgren did? <laughs> no, what? The Punisher. <laughs> oh, they forgot the Punisher, did they? Yes. <laughs> it's only a Punisher film in name. Yeah. Um, but here's the most interesting thing about the list, the official list of Yakuza films on Wikipedia. The official list? The no official way. list on Wikipedia. Here we go with the official list. So the list of Yakuza films on Wikipedia is not actually a comprehensive list. It's not a complete list. It's just selected films. So this isn't all the films by any means. But one of the films that made the cut of Yakuza films is the 1991 masterpiece Samurai Cop. No way. <laughs> which we talked about. <laughs> I'm like, why are you, you know, hyping this up so much? No Rules Film School I'm like, podcast. <laughs> the last time you hyped something up was when you mentioned me on the um, black exploitation filmmakers. I'm like, oh, yes. I didn't make a Yakuza yes. film. Why is he he's hyping this up so much? <laughs> Samurai yes. Cop. Samurai Cop, of all things, oh, makes man. the list of Yakuza films, which, you know, I love Samurai Cop. I love it. I think it's a wonderfully bad movie. It is so um, bad. <laughs> yeah. The, the thing I love in that movie and, is at one part of the movie, 
He's an expert on the Yakuza. That's why they have him. Another part of the movie yeah. is like, you know, this Samaguchi, Samayuchi, whatever his name is. Like, you know, he's like, <laughs> another part, he doesn't know anything. <laughs> yeah. One part, he's an expert. Another part, he can't even pronounce their names right. And he's just mocking their culture. Um, but yeah, that's funny. That's funny. Yes. Yeah, so I couldn't believe they included that as if it's a serious Yakuza film. But it's really one of the greatest bad movies ever made. Ever. Yeah, ever. So bad, it's good. It's it's a masterpiece of badness. Highly it, recommended. It, to me, it's an ultimate bad movie because I love sex. I love nudity. I don't love action films. But when it comes to good, bad movies, I love action films. There's something about bad action to me that's great. Um, yes. And it's 80s. 80s is my, that's my era for movies. Because um, I remember being video stores when I was a kid in the 80s. So yeah. for me, that's like an ultimate bad movie. It just has so many elements. Sex, nudity, violence, action, terrible one-liners. Uh, it's just, it's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, it is. So... There you go. It is officially a Yakuza film. Oh. Much like Tokyo Drifter. Yes. So, um, well, What would have been interesting is a showdown between the shooting star and the Phoenix. Because yeah. these, the these are the two badasses in the movie. It's to get yes. them for a way to turn on each other and to see them have a showdown. Because they didn't really do a good job of building up an antagonist for him to fight. They have the antagonist yeah. to go against in his boss in that script wise it's a good antagonist but any good action movie you need the big boss antagonist that's just a powerful character the biz the guy in the business suit that you're going against but you also need the tough guy henchman where it's like could he really beat this guy in a fight you know and um i think like bruce lee movies had that um uh, which what was the movie where he fought um kareem abdul jabbar uh, Game of um, Death. Game of Death. So yeah. you had the the unstoppable monster in Kareem Abdul Jabbar, but the big boss was just this white guy in a suit, you know, and that's yeah. where he did the magic hand thing, you know. So yeah. you always need like the big boss, but you also need like the henchman that like you don't know if he can win in a fight. And Shooting yeah. Star would have been a perfect um, opponent for him, or if they would have built up one of the other henchmen to be like. Yeah. Uh, like an actual force, you know, because it lacks yeah. the drama at the end of like, is he going to win or is he not going to win? You didn't really feel any sense of danger. No, no. I guess they almost would have had to create a sense of these two guys because they're kind of helping each other or he's helping uh, Tetsu. Um, but, you know, there would have had to be a sense of they don't really want to fight each other. But maybe they have to for some reason. They're kind of forced into fighting at the end of yeah. the movie, and so they some kind of don't want to Yakuza do it. honor or like yeah, you know. yeah, exactly. Um, that could have been something for sure. Yeah, and it could have been like this, like you know, sun setting. They're standing at a yeah. distance. Like we could both just walk away, and it could be like you know, neither of us could do that. Mm -hmm. It's a shame it had to end this way. Well, if I had yes. to go, I'd want it to be from you. You know, something like that. Yes, I'm enjoying this movie that didn't exist. <laughs> I'm enjoying yeah. this. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, okay. if I go, will you tell my girl? Only if you promise to do the same for me. You know, it's like, oh, this yes. life we chose. This life we chose. <laughs> and then, boom. Yeah. You could hear, like, two gunshots and fade to yeah. black. You don't know who won. You know? Yeah. That would have been awesome. Or you could have had like um, one guy says ready and he pretends to pull out his gun and then the other guy shoots him. He's like, you know, it's like, you know, and the shooting star sacrifices himself, you know, and it's like Phoenix could have been like, why, why? He's like, kid, I wanted you to live. And if anyone was going to die, I wanted to be you killing me. You know, something like that. Yeah. yeah some like badass shit like that would have been cool. Oh, yeah. That would have been great. Yeah. 
Wow. Maybe I'll have to consider doing a remake. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, it's interesting that uh, music features so much into this with the song. And um, they talk about Tetsuya Watari, who plays our hero, as if he was a singer. And apparently he did have at least one hit song um, some years after this. But I can't find too much information about that. Like he mainly talked about as an actor. And he did go on to a successful acting career after this. But... Um, but there doesn't seem to be a whole lot about him as a singer other than that one hit I could find. Um, but Kieko Matsubara, who plays uh, his love interest, Sally Kayama, who also sings in this movie, she also was a singer. Um, and uh, apparently she did release some singles. They talk about albums. I could only find some singles um, that were released between 1967 and 69. But she, uh, she also was a singer of some note. So music was uh, definitely important here. And, uh, and actually, they both went on to appear in the sequel to this movie. Because yes, they did make a sequel. Uh, Tokyo Drifter 2. Um, which I Keep on drifting. <laughs> drifting yeah, <so>. Boogaloo. <laughs> Different director. Though. Tokyo <laughs> Drifter. Too fast, too drifter. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, but they, yeah, they have the same two stars, but uh, but I think that she plays a, a different character in, in uh, Tokyo Drifter 2, I think. Uh, so they there's, actually to... a, there's actually a history of like movie stars with like one hit song that a oh, few yes. generations pass and Nobody even though they even attempted to sing. Bruce yeah. Willis, Eddie Murphy, yeah. Yeah. William Shatner. Um, yeah. I think even Patrick Swayze. It's a lot. Yes. It, it happens a lot. Yes. And some yeah. of the songs are hits. But then like yeah. a couple generations pass, you're like, he never sang. <laughs> Bullshit. Name the song, you know? Yeah. That's right. Well, even Robert Mitchum was a singer at one time. Country singer. Um, I think I had an old KTEL record that was given to me by one of my uncles, uh, old country songs, and he was. How was it watching him perform live? Uh, <laughs> he he was electric, man. When he when he <laughs> took the stage in the, that country saloon, yeah, that was uh, that was life altering to see that. <laughs> Watching a I young Robert was... Mitchell perform. Oh <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, he was he was younger than me. It was uh, it was awesome. <laughs> oh yes. Oh man, I don't even know how old you are. You're probably like a year older than me, or maybe the same age. Just your beard. Yeah. Your beard. That's me. I think I have a few years on you, but um, it doesn't matter. But, yeah. I'm not yeah. gonna stop. Yeah. I'm not gonna. I'm right. not gonna slow down. I've always been an old spirit. You know, even as a child, I, I always liked hanging out with the old people. Everybody's grandmother liked me for some reason. So That sounds creepy. So, so I, it does sound a bit creepy now that I say it out loud. But, uh, <laughs> sounds like you were down for some gummy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I don't know. I guess I've always been kind of old in a way. I always liked older music, older movies. Yeah. So this ending is really strange to me because, I mean, it was somewhat um, surreal for elements, but this flat out feels like a studio, you know? Yeah. It just looks a little too fake. Yeah. And then they do that color shift there too, right? Where the where it looks, yeah. it makes it even look more like a cheap like warehouse, <laughs> with just like a couple of props. Yeah. It, it, it almost feels like no effort was given to this ending. Like, the actors do fine, but I'm saying, like, the, the location, the setup, it yeah. just feels so cheap. Now, I did. he did mention they redid the end. Yes. Um, but I'm not sure how much of the end they actually redid, but I'm just yeah. not a big fan of the location of this ending. Yeah. It's like, let's just put, like, a big pi a piano in the middle of the floor, like, one big art piece, and then it's just... Mm -hmm. A big open warehouse. Yeah. You know? 
that's yeah, supposed to be the club, I guess. I guess. But yeah. we've seen the club the whole movie. It doesn't they ain't like this. They've no. been dancing. There was she danced and performed there and yeah. they had an early shootout there and this is clearly not okay. that location. Yeah. I don't know. It's the kind of thing that people talk about, you know, like movies that were low budget and couldn't build an entire set. And then they talk about how, oh, yes, that adds to the surrealism or that adds to the storybook element. We can see that the set hasn't been completed or whatever. You know, they find a way to make it seem like a brilliant choice. And uh, I'm sure this is no different here for some people. It's a brilliant, empty, white space. I don't know if this uh, ending was supposed to solicit heavy emotion. You have his boss committing suicide, him leaving his yeah. girlfriend because a drifter drifts alone. It yeah, didn't really, that, like, uh, I wasn't invested at all in these characters, honestly. Yeah. It's not well, like the, the, the bo his boss made this, like, tough decision. When the boss turned on him, he's like, okay, I'll turn on. If it was, like, more of, like, a tough, gut-wrenching decision, then watching the boss take his own life would have meant something. Or maybe yeah. if like we had more scenes of the couple together, like I would care about them coming together. He didn't even care yeah. to come back to her. No. It was about revenge against his boss, you know? So the fact yeah. that they're leaving each other and she's crying, like I wasn't really invested at all in the in yeah. this ending. Yeah, well I just thought it was a little bit odd and I guess it's kind of meant to be that Western kind of ending, you know, where the gunfighter goes off alone on his horse into the sunset and, uh, mm -hmm. doesn't doesn't get the girl at the end of the movie you know um but it just didn't feel satisfying to me it didn't really make sense to me no it doesn't but as our tokyo drifter drifts on so must we thanks for watching this is screened for angus Cone. i'm sean weathers We'll see you next time.